Welcome to our presentation on the Red River of the North. I look forward to sharing the wonders of this river that crosses international boundaries and provides great wealth and challenges to those who live within its watershed. One of the challenges with many bodies of water is to ensure that we are talking about the same body of water. Many lakes and rivers share names, so we have to be certain that we are on the same page in terms of our specific body of water. I live in Minnesota, and we have more big lakes and long lakes than you can shake a stick at. So while some bodies of water have unique names that are instantly identifiable, others may share a more common name. In this discussion, we are going to look at the Red River. However, which Red River will we be looking at? When I started this presentation, I said we are going to be looking at the Red River of the North. In the US, we have two major Red Rivers. Depending upon where you live, your mental image of the Red River may default to one or the other of these rivers. If you live in the southern United States around Texas and Oklahoma, you may think about the Red River that drains into the Mississippi River. While this is undoubtedly a great river, it is not the one we are going to be looking at in this presentation. Rather, we are going to be looking at the Red River of the North, which runs through the eastern Great Plains and into Canada, eventually draining into Lake Winnipeg and into Hudson Bay. For my convenience, I am going to refer to this river as the Red River and Drop of the North. I think we would both get tired of me saying that all the time. The Red River Basin is a fairly large watershed in the northeastern Great Plains region of North America. The main stem of the river starts through the junction where Minnesota, North Dakota, and South Dakota meet, and runs north into Lake Winnipeg. The Red River flows through the landscape defined by Glacial Lake Agassiz. If you have not viewed that presentation, I encourage you to do so, either now or after you view this presentation, so that you can deepen your understanding of this landscape. The main stem of the Red River begins at the confluence of the Bois de Sioux River and the Ottertail River. An interesting side note about the headwaters of the Bois de Sioux River is that it drains Lake Traverse, which lies on the border of Minnesota and South Dakota, and is the southernmost area of the Hudson Bay drainage. The Red River Basin is a neat basin, and we will have all kinds of little trivia facts. With all these fascinating trivia facts about the Red River, I will highlight them in specific callouts like this one to reinforce your learning and improve your scores on trivia nights. The Red River flows north, dividing North Dakota from Minnesota and crossing into Manitoba, Canada near Emerson. The river continues flowing north until it passes by the city of Breezy Point, finally draining into Lake Winnipeg. The watershed map of the Red River Basin has an odd exclusion area. Why does this region appear to lie outside of the Red River watershed? This region is identified as lying outside of the Red River Basin because it is an enclosed basin in which all the water that flows into this region drains into Devil's Lake and Stump Lake. The topography around this basin is high enough that the water has to reach a really high point before it reaches the natural drainage into the Red River Basin. In the recent past, high water levels within Devil's Lake have resulted in massive flooding that has inundated towns and interfered with transportation. The water had gotten so high that it actually reached the High Point Natural Outlet and was flowing into the Cheyenne River, which is a tributary of the Red River. Because of the closed nature of the basin, Devil's Lake water is a bit higher in salt content than the Red River. As the Red River is a multi-state and international river, the potential of draining water from a closed basin into a system that will eventually reach a commercially valuable fishery generated a bit of controversy between North Dakota, Manitoba, and the United States and Canada. So when your friends ask you about the international relations, you can bring up the Devil's Lake drainage border conflict between the US and Canada. Always a good piece of information to have in your back pocket in a moment of need. The Red River has some characteristics that make it behave in interesting ways. First, let's look at the location of the basin. The basin lies in the north central region of North America. This means that it has long cold winters with snowfall and ice common during these months. The soils in this region freeze early and thaw late 
meaning that water does not infiltrate during the spring melt. The river also flows north. This means that as the river lies in the northern hemisphere, as the spring thaw occurs, the melt happens from south to north. As the melt waters flow to the north, they are constantly encountering frozen conditions the further north the river flows. In severe conditions, the northern frozen region can act as a dam and force the meltwater to back up, leading to upstream flooding. The current river channel flows through the middle of Lake Agassiz. This provides two conditions related to how the Red River functions. First, it is a fairly young river, not more than 9,000 years old, so it is still in the process of defining its floodplain. The river basin has a thick layer of topsoil that was established by the prairie environment that existed prior to European colonization and settlement. Under this layer is a thick layer of Lake Agassiz sediments running to 100 feet in depth. As the river generally runs through the middle of the old lake, many of these sediments are clay that are generally slow to allow for percolation of water into the profile. There are two kinds of floodplains that exist in the Red River Basin. The dynamic floodplain is the existing one that tends to be only a few hundred feet wide and only a few yards deep. So on any given day, the river lies within a very narrow channel. Because of the level nature of the Red River Valley floor, the effective floodplain is the entire river basin. During severe flood events, the river rises to encompass large swaths of the basin because there is only a very limited defined effective floodplain that could contain even the smallest floods. The Red River Basin also lies on the eastern edge of the Great Plains, where the average rainfall is between 12 and 20 inches. This means that the system is generally drier than many other river systems and droughty conditions are common. With less rainfall, there is less force of water in the river to speed the formation of a well-defined floodplain. While flat, sediment-laden, and low energy might be a way of defining my moves on the dance floor, it is also why the Red River is so sinuous. Rather than cutting a defined channel in the landscape, it meanders back and forth depending upon the level of energy at any given meander. These conditions mean that overall the river tends to move only slightly each year, generally less than a third of a meter. The location of the Red River on the northern portion of the eastern Great Plains creates conditions for a broad range of water quantity conditions. On one side of the spectrum, the river has massive, almost basin-wide flood events. On the other side, the river experiences droughty conditions in which it can run dry for a substantial period of time. It is truly a river that can have two personalities, often separated by just a few years. Severe flooding in the Red River Valley is not uncommon. Most cities have established some measure of flood control to defend against high waters. However, in the most severe floods, even these defense mechanisms fail, and we can see substantial portions of major cities fall victim to floodwaters overtopping levees. Here is another trivia fact. During the height of the 1997 flood in Grand Forks, North Dakota, when the fire department was in the middle of sandbagging the river to hold back the floodwaters and evacuating people from low-lying areas, the Grand Forks Herald office newspaper caught fire. So in the middle of a flood, the department had to fight a fire. The fire department even called in a fire retardant aerial bomber to help contain the flames. So another bar trivia question. What city used an aerial retardant drop to fight a fire in the middle of a flood? That would be Grand Forks, North Dakota. People along the river have largely adopted three strategies to deal with the periodic flooding that threatens their property and livelihood. One strategy is the medieval approach to warfare, which is to build a wall around your city and fight to keep the water outside. Many cities have built flood walls and dikes that are meant to keep the waters at bay, and these structures can be massive due to the potential height of the flood waters and the need for a long-term barrier that could withstand several weeks of assault from the river. It is not only cities that install ring dikes or flood walls to provide property protection. When one drives up and down the valley, many of the farm sites that lie in the lowest portion of the basin are also protected by ring dikes. During periods of flood, these homesteads become little islands of dryness, surrounded by acres upon acres of flooded land. 
If the city is too large to build a dike around or wants to pursue a different flood mitigation strategy, there is the possibility of installing a floodway. A floodway is a dug channel around the city that effectively expands the width of the channel, giving floodwater somewhere to go around the city rather than rise within the natural channel that flows through the city. This can be an expensive option, but one that has shown some success in Winnipeg. This image of a piece of land shows how one of the cities in the basin has chosen to establish a park adjacent to the river, restoring part of the river's natural floodplain. Now, when the river rises, it can flood onto lightly developed parkland and not into homes or other heavily developed areas. In some of these areas, the city has chosen to combine floodplain restoration with the use of dikes as a way to provide multiple options to deal with floodwaters. While the recent history of the Red River is one of severe and damaging floods, that is not the whole story of the Red. As the river lies on the eastern edge of the Great Plains, it is also subject to droughty conditions that lower water levels and reduce flows. In recorded history, the Red River ran dry for not insignificant periods of time. Here is another Family Fun Day trivia fact. In the 1930s, the Red River had no flow for 823 days in the Fargo area. So it is a river of contrasts with high catastrophic floods and low water levels that pose serious concerns for those who need the river for things like drinking water. Moving on from water quantity issues, let's look at some of the current water quality issues in the river. We will start with one of the more common features that can be found in the river and which is partially caused by the relative youth of the river, sediment. Sediment is a feature of the Red River as it slowly migrates across the floodplain. As the river naturally migrates across the landscape, it is going to erode in some places and deposit soil in other places. This is a natural process, which I cover in my Introduction to Watersheds video. As the Red River is still seeking to establish a more permanent and defined channel, this process is happening a little more quickly than we would find in other river systems. Before the arrival of Europeans, the Red River Basin was largely dominated by prairies interspersed with stands of riparian forests. This native vegetation had a thick root system that tended to hold the soils in place and resist surface erosion. However, as the Europeans arrived in the region and realized the incredible productivity of these soils, the prairies and riparian forests were quickly replaced with annual crops that had shallower root systems that were less effective in holding the soil in place. This change in vegetation is one of the reasons we are seeing more sediment in the river today. With the replacement of perennial plants with annual crops, the Red River Valley saw increased rates of erosion from two sources. First, as water moved along the exposed soil on the surface, it easily picked up particles and carried them down slope into the river channels. In addition, the Red River Valley is known for wind. As these winds increase in velocity, they pick up soil particles, carrying them over the land and frequently depositing them in the river channels and other lowlands where they can add sediment load to the river. When it comes to chemistry within the Red River Valley, there are three primary contaminants that we tend to worry about. These are phosphorus, nitrates, and heavy metals. In addition to higher levels of sediment, the Red River is seeing higher than expected levels of phosphorus. Much of this phosphorus comes from runoff from the land due to agricultural production. As this phosphorus flows downstream into Lake Winnipeg, it contributes around 2,600 tons of phosphorus to the lake. With this much phosphorus entering Lake Winnipeg, there are more algae blooms. These algae blooms create a variety of negative outcomes, including harming the fishery and reducing recreational quality. It is generally not the phosphorus itself that causes water quality problems. Rather, it is what happens when there is a lot of additional phosphorus in the system. One pound of phosphorus can produce more than 500 pounds of algae, which can cause many problems for other life forms in lakes and streams. Nitrate has not reached levels where it's listed as a pollutant. However, levels of nitrate are increasing within the system, as there are several cities like Fargo and Moorhead that draw at least some of their drinking water from the river, this increase in nitrate is a cause for concern.
Once nitrates reach unsafe levels for drinking water, the technology to remove it is very expensive. Heavy metals such as mercury, PCBs, and arsenic are found throughout the Red River. These heavy metals occur in such concentrations as to require an advisory the amount of fish from the river one should eat. The vast majority of these sources come from outside of the basin, including upwind burning of coal for energy. According to the Minnesota Pollution Control Agency, the biology of the river is pretty good. In the headwater tributary rivers and streams, there is a good assemblage of the expected species. However, as one moves into the main channel and downstream, reductions in water quality, changes in flow, and increase in sediment appears to be resulting in a reduction in the number of species. However, while there are fewer catfish as big as a man, one can still catch some pretty big lunkers in the main stem. Oh, and by the way, these kind of fish are why I do not swim in rivers. I discussed the role of physics in both the watershed video and the magic of water video. The physics of the land management within and around the Red River present some challenges to achieving the conditions desired by those living within the basin. There are seven dams along the main channel of the Red River. In the past, many of these dams were constructed as low-head dams. The image here is a low-head dam near Drayton, North Dakota. You are probably asking yourself, what is a low-head dam? I'm glad that you asked. These are smaller dams over which water continually flows over the entire length of the dam as opposed to going through a single spillway. In many cases, these dams are used to either divert the water or to control the grade, which can reduce in-channel erosion and the cutting of the channel into its bed. However, these low-head dams do cause challenges for fish passage. In the Red River, many of these low-head dams are being converted to rock riffle structures that serve the same function as the low-head dam, but are constructed in a way to enhance the ability of fish to navigate through the structure. These riffle structures and dam modify the physics in the river by changing the velocity of the river, which can alter erosion. In addition, sediment can settle out behind these dams, resulting in changes in water velocity, both up and downstream of the dams. Another feature in the red, like many other rivers, is the drainage occurring within the larger watershed. Once agricultural production arrived in the basin, the wet nature of the soil quickly proved itself to be a problem to the optimum growth of crops. Therefore, moving that water off the land and downstream became a priority, and the European settlers built drainage ditches to move water from the land to the streams and downstream to the river. This increased the flow in the river, which resulted in more bank erosion as the river adapted to the increase in water supply. In addition to recent changes in the landscape, the glacial history of the region affects the river dynamics. This artist's rendering of the Laurentide ice sheet gives an impression of the size of the glacier front. However, deeper in the heart of the glacier, the ice sheet was several kilometers thick. This amount of ice weighed a tremendous amount. It weighed so much that it dented the crust of the planet. The center of the Laurentide ice sheet was located just about at the north edge of where Lake Winnipeg now lies. This is where the glacier pressed deepest against the planet. As the glacier melted, the Earth began returning to its original shape, much like an inflated balloon will do when you remove the pressure of your hand from one spot. This process of land recovering from the weight of a glacier is known as isostatic rebound. In the case of the Red River Basin, the northern portion of the basin is recovering elevation faster than the southern portion, which means that Lake Winnipeg is slowly creeping southward. While isostatic rebound is not terribly rapid, at about 20 centimeters per year, this is still pretty quick when one thinks about the geologic time and the flatness of the Red River Basin. If you and your friends are a bit of gamblers, here's an interesting bet to put on the table next time you all gather together. With isostatic rebound occurring faster in the northern part of Lake Winnipeg than in the rest of the basin, how far south will Lake Winnipeg expand? Will it eventually creep into Winnipeg? Will it cross the border at Pembina? How about Grand Forks or Fargo? Where would you buy beachfront property in the expectation of Lake Winnipeg coming south? The management of the Red River is complicated because of the many jurisdictions that have authority over different parts of the river.
we could start looking at the river and the role that individual landowners play. However, I am going to start at the other end of the spectrum. The Red River of the North spans two countries, Canada and the United States of America. As such, this means that water management enters into the realm of international relations. The main stem of the Red crosses the international border as it moves from the United States to Canada. Therefore, Canadians are very interested in water quality and quantity as it flows across the border. Sharing information about water quantity is particularly important during flood events. Canadians are also very interested in water quality because Lake Winnipeg is a commercial fishery about which Canadians in general and Manitobans in particular are very concerned. Beyond the main stem of the river and really confounding the international relationship are those tributaries that start out in Canada, enter the United States, and then flow back into Canada either as independent tributaries or as part of the larger Red River. In the latter case, we have the Pembina River, which starts here in Canada, shown in red, before it crosses the North Dakota border. Once the Pembina River enters North Dakota, it flows east until it enters the main stem of the red, just south of the border. An example of a tributary that crosses the border twice is the Suris River. Here the Suris starts in Saskatchewan. Then it flows into North Dakota, spending a bit of time in the United States before it curves back north and enters Canada at the Manitoba-North Dakota border. Then the Suris flows into the Assiniboine before eventually entering the main stem of the Red in Winnipeg. So for the Suris River, we have two countries, two provinces, one state, and two sub-watersheds. As you can imagine, Discussing this river system involves a lot of coordination. The International Joint Commission is an organization that provides a forum to discuss cross-border water issues between the two nations. These discussions consist of both quantity and quality issues. The IJC is a treaty-based organization, which makes it a formal entity with specific powers related to water management between the two nations. While the IJC oversees all the rivers that cross the Canadian-U.S. border, in 2021, the International Red River Watershed Board was established to focus on issues specifically related to the Red River. Outside of the formal treaty organization of the IJC, there is the Red River Basin Commission, which serves as the larger forum for most of the partners within the watershed to meet and discuss issues related to management. The RRBC has representatives from the two countries, two states, one province, many local government partners, and affected tribal nations. Unlike many intergovernmental partnerships that are defined by statute, the Red River Basin Commission is a not-for-profit charitable organization, which is not typical for an organization that deals with such a large and complicated issues around water management. While the Red River Basin Commission is a non-profit organization that brings together a variety of organizations to discuss basin-wide management issues within the Red River, there are many states and provinces that also independently work within the basin. Within these state or provincial governments, there are several agencies and organizations that are tasked with managing certain parts of the basin. For example, within one state, the Game and Fish Department might manage the fishery within their portion of the Red River Basin while the State Forest Service might work with landowners to manage the forest resources. Fortunately, all these different state organizations tend to work well together at the individual staff level and within the larger organizational context. On a side note, I'm including Saskatchewan on this list because the Assiniboine River, which starts in Saskatchewan, drains into the Red River. Below the state government level, there are a host of local government entities that have jurisdiction wholly or partially within the Red River Basin. Some of these organizations may have only a slight role in the management of the land and water resources within the basin. However, even those with a limited territory and interest can play a role in determining how those who live and work within their jurisdiction interact with local water and land resources. This is just a small list of potential organizations. There are many other local governing entities that are not included on this list. As with the local government entities that may have an interest within the Red River Basin, there are more private and not-for-profit organizations than one could shake a stick at when it comes to having an interest in the management of the land and water resources within the basin. 
For many individuals, these organizations may be the primary source of information through which they learn about management options within the area. These groups can also have a powerful influence on determining policy at the local, state, and national level. And this brings us to the most important influence on the Red River of the North. Whether it's an angler fishing on the river, a farmer making her living from the incredibly deep and fertile soils, children learning about the river basin in which they are growing up, or a person with intense interest in the long-term health of the river, it is individuals who are making choices about how to manage this resource. These are the people who will decide the condition of the river for the present and the future. As a group, they have made recent decisions to seek to improve the quality of the river and to adapt to the strange flooding nature within the basin. They are likely to continue going down this path in the future as well. Through their decisions and actions, they are working to ensure the Red River remains one of the world's great rivers for positive reasons. Today, the Red River and many of the tributaries are recognized canoe routes. This connection of the modern canoeist with the traditional use of the river by Native American, First Nations, and Métis communities shows how the river can be appreciated across many generations. Between these two canoe periods, there is a brief period when steam-powered paddle boats churned up and down the Red River. The first paddle boat in the river was the Anson Northrop that made the trip from Breckenridge to Fort Garry, which would become Winnipeg. The last paddleboat left Grand Forks in 1910, and this 50-year span of the glory days of paddleboats came to an end, replaced by rail and car. I think those captains who piloted these ships up and down the curvy channels of the river, where they had to learn to make three-point turns around the sharp bends found on the main stem of the river, must have been very special men. Also men who probably chewed their fingernails to the quick, hoping to avoid that unseen snag that was just waiting to spear through the keel of their wooden ship. Wait, let's have one more trivia fact. Here we have two Canadians ice skating in the winter, which is a fairly typical scene. But wait, there's more to it. These folks are not skating on a lake. They are skating on the Assiniboine River Ice Skating Trail, which is maintained by the city of Winnipeg. Go Canada! Whether it be for the canoeing, the skating, hiking along the river, or fishing for the lunker, I encourage you to schedule a visit on the Red River of the North. It is truly one of the world's great rivers.